to the first Lung Chats Live with Ian Rankin. So I'm very pleased to present this event as part of Good Week Scotland 2019. So just a quick intro, Lung Chats Theatre Company is the UK's leading theatre company working with people with learning disabilities who have toured and produced over 40 shows since 1984. And we're also producing with Six Point Productions, which is an emerging theatre company made up of fourth year acting and English students from Edinburgh Napier University. So you can read about both companies on the programme that was handed out. Uh, so Lung Ha Theatre Company launched Lung Chats series earlier this year, and we're very pleased to be able to present the first ever live episode. And as you may know, the company has been very lucky to have interviewed key figures from the Scottish arts scene, and we're extremely excited to be now adding one of the world's most celebrated crime writers, Mr. Ian Rankin, to the list. <laughs> We've got a couple of housekeeping rules just before we start. We've not planned a fire drill, so if there's an alarm, it'll be real, so follow the procedure and go to your nearest exit. The whole event is being filmed and it'll be available to watch with captions on the Lung Hai YouTube channel in the next couple of days. We also have a photographer taking pictures throughout. The event is BSL interpreted by Yvonne. And we'll start the chat shortly, which will proceed to a Q&A. We'll have a chance to ask some questions. And then there'll be a book signing over at that table there. And the event will finish about nine o'clock. And after the event, we'd really appreciate it if you could take some time to follow the information on this little sheet and fill out the survey for Book Week Scotland. That would be much appreciated. And lastly, if you have any other thoughts you'd like to share, you can use the hashtag Lung Chats and Book Week Scotland. So without any further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Ian Rankin, Nikki Tuxworth and Gavin Yule. And we'll start the interview. <laughs> Well, to begin at the beginning, <laughs> has stories and reading books been something that you have enjoyed from, well, from a very early age? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't grow up in a, a book-filled uh, household. My parents didn't read many books, but from a very early age, I enjoyed reading. And my dad was a storyteller. He would. Um, tell me stories about invented characters when you know when I was like three, four years old. And with a good library, a Carnegie library in the village where I grew up, and I would take the maximum number of books out allowed. Went to a bookshop in the village at Carden Den, was the village. Um, but we did have a news agent, and they sold lots and lots of comics. And the first things I ever tried writing were comics. So, like the, the dandy and the vino. So I was trying to be an artist, a cartoonist, a writer, and a publisher. Because I would get a piece of paper and fold it in half and make a little booklet and break it up into squares and have little stick figures and speech bubbles. Um, and I would put a free gift on the front. <laughs> and I'd make a badge, stick it on the front, and I would show it to my mum, who would say, Ian, you can't draw. <laughs> And, you know, but that was it. That was me starting. It wasn't enough from a very early age. It wasn't enough to be a consumer. I wanted to be a creator. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, well, I suppose with books as well, they have this ability to create worlds that just draw you in. Was that quite a big, a big influence for you to be drawn into these worlds that the books presented? I think so. I mean, I think um, Curtin Den was not the most glamorous <laughs> location. It wasn't the most exciting place to grow up. It was very tribal. Uh, everybody knew everybody. It was a place where it was hard to keep secrets. Um, you know, we had uncles and aunts who lived next door, over the back fence, around the corner. Um, you were always going in and out of people's houses. No doors were locked grey, very safe, very comfortable, but if you felt different, it could be quite stifling. And I would sit in my little bedroom, tiny bedroom, six feet by six, and books became my universe. So I could travel anywhere 
through time and space. Books were like a TARDIS. And I could, I could end up in prehistoric times, I could end up in the future, I could go to America, I could go all over the world to any historical period and have adventures in my head. And that was really, really important to me because that was in the period before I was going to the cinema. Um, and, and so books were, in part, they were an education and they were escape, a form of escapism. Um, and of course they were also, let's be honest, when you're 11, 12 years old, you cannot get into an adult film but nobody's stopping you reading the book. <laughs> they were a form, of, they were an access point to an adult world that I thought was supposed to be closed off to me. Um, Ian, um, you say that obviously you were quite a big reader when you were young, but um, was there ever a certain person or a certain point in your life that inspired you to become a writer? Um, it's difficult, uh, Gavin, because I didn't, you know, there weren't many writers around. I mean, living in Carbon Den in the 60s and 70s, I didn't get access to real, living, breathing writers. Um, except in high school, when occasionally a poet would be bust in um, to try and enthuse these very unenthusiastic teenagers. Um, but I had a succession of very good English teachers. I mean, a good teacher can take you a long way in your future career. And I seemed to get really lucky with that. And there was one teacher when I was at high school in Cowden Beef, Mr. Gillespie, who just was very enthusiastic about the creative writing I was doing, the short stories that I was writing, and just gave me the confidence to, to keep going. But it wasn't until I arrived in Edinburgh, <coughs> aged 18, to go to university, I actually started to meet writers. And of course, the first question was, who's your agent? <laughs> and can you introduce me to your publisher? Um, but it was like a different world. You know, it was like a different world. And, uh, and very quickly, I knew that I wanted to be not only a writer, but a publisher. And uh, just to add to that, actually, out of all the genres, um, that you could have picked to write for, you know, for example, romance or comedy or farce. Or <laughs> you don't really know me, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, all the genres. Yeah. Why? Why did you pick crime fiction? I, I, you know, I, I I don't really think I did pick crime fiction. I think crime fiction picked me. Um, the first novel I wrote, well, let's go back. When I was at high school, I wrote a very short book that I thought was a novel, but it was probably only about thirty pages long in stolen jotters from the English department. And it's about a young guy growing up in a, a town called Carbondale who <laughs> feels he's not, he can't be understood, he's poetic, he's got a poetic soul, and he's not being understood, so he runs away to London. And nobody there understands him either, so he jumps in the Thames and drowns. <laughs> and that was never published. Um, um, and then, when I got to university in Edinburgh, I wrote a novel called Summer Rights, R-I-T-E-S, which was a comedy set in a hotel in the Highlands, featuring a kid with special powers and a schizophrenic librarian. And that was never published either. Um, and then my very first published book was called The Flood and was set in Carbon Den. Um, and at that time I thought I wanted to be a literary novelist. And I was doing a PhD on the novels of Muriel Spark. And she got me interested in Jekyll and Hyde. And that interest made me want to rewrite Jekyll and Hyde in a 1980s, a modern context, set in Edinburgh, which is where I thought the original book should be set, or Stevenson chose to set it in London. And I just decided the main guy would be a cop. So Rebus was meant to be Jekyll and Hyde. And um, nobody realized that. <laughs> he was a cop, so it was published as a crime novel. And I walked into um, Thin's bookshop, now Blackwell's, uh, Southbridge, and looked for my book in the Scottish literature section, <laughs> and it wasn't there. It was in the crime section. I thought, what the hell? So I moved it <laughs> into the literature section. 
beside Muriel Spark, I wrote Louis Stevenson, and I was just R for Rankin, just before that. Went back a couple of days later, and back in the crime section, <laughs> beside Ruth Rendell and P.D. James. So then I started reading crime fiction. I didn't read crime fiction until, until I'd written crime fiction. And I, I, I clearly remember going to see um, a guy called Alan Massey. Alan Massey was a novelist and critic he still reviews for the Scotsman. Um, and he was a kind of creative writing lecturer at the university at that time. And I said, oh my God, Alan, I've written a crime novel by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, you may not get the literary medals and novels and Booker Prize, but you might make some cash. <laughs> and I went, that'll do me. <laughs> Actually, moving on to the subject of rebirths, which, uh, which is not only quite a long book series and still going, but it's also been a nominated TV series. Mm. And how did you feel about that, about your work actually coming on to the TV? Oh, well, it was a very long process. When the first Rebus novel was published, uh, I was living in London. I was newly married and living in London and didn't have much money. In the first Rebus novel, I didn't get much money for, but I got a letter from my agent saying there's TV interest in this. And the person who was interested was an actor called Leslie Grantham. And Leslie Grantham at that time was the biggest actor in the UK because he was dirty then in EastEnders. So he was a character in the soul of EastEnders. And him and a producer started a, a TV, a film company, and wanted the first Rebus novel, which at that time was going to be the only Rebus novel. But he wanted to move the story to London, and he would play Rebus as a Londoner. And I went, yes! Because they were offering me £25,000, which was 10 times what I got paid for the book. And I thought, <laughs> Give me that. You know, I'm, I'm never going to write about this guy again. I'm very happy. Then my agent disappeared. This is a true story. My agent disappeared in mysterious circumstances and the whole project fell through. A couple of years later, the BBC got the option for Rebus and they were going to give it to a, a young, physically fit, tough guy actor called Robbie Coltrane. <laughs> and I said, well, um, I don't know much about Rebus, but I know he's been in the army, he's been in the parachute regiment, he's trained for the SAS, he probably doesn't look too much like Robbie Coltrane. <laughs> um, and the flashbacks to his army training are going to be really interesting. <laughs> anyway, Robbie Coltrane went and did uh, Cracker instead. So again, it went quiet. And then John Hanna, the actor from Four Weddings and a Funeral, had a wee production company. And he wanted to do it. And ITV, STV, said to him, we'll give you the money to make this if you promise you will play Rebus. And I don't think he wanted to do it. I don't, th I don't think he felt physically he was the right guy to do it. But it would never have got made without him. So it got made. And I, I phoned up a few friends of mine who were crime writers whose work had been made in TV shows. And I said, what do I do? They said, well, you can get involved or you can walk away. It's fun to get involved, but you might find that the actor changes your perception of your character. Mm -hmm. So that definitely happened to Colin Dexter with Inspector Morse. If you read the early Inspector Morse books, he's not a pleasant character. But the actor, John Thaw, influenced um, Colin Dexter with later books. So he made his character more like the actor. And I thought, I don't want that to happen. So I promised myself I would never watch an episode. So I never watched it with John Hanna. Then it was given to Ken Stott. Fans were much happier physically with Ken Stott as, as Rebus. In fact, he was more physically like him. Again, I still didn't watch it. So I've never watched it, and I never will. 
I, I think that would walk on cars. I had a couple of cameos walking down the street. And I remember it clearly, the one with, uh, I mean, John Hanna one was funny because he's, I'm walking towards him and he's got his back to the camera walking down the street and he just kept sticking his tongue out at me. <laughs> <laughs> so I kept laughing. And he'd go, cut! <laughs> and he would say, this guy's a fucking amateur. <laughs> he's, you know, he can't even, he can't walk down the street without bursting into laughter. They didn't know, because the camera was facing the back of his head, they had no idea he was making it. So it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Um, I then had a guest appearance on one of the Ken Stock ones, and I was, the, I was the heroic pedestrian. And he said, Ian, do you want a little role in the next one? Yeah, great, okay, what do I do? You're the heroic pedestrian. You rescue Rebus's girlfriend, Miranda, from the red-headed guy. And I went, which book is this? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, it's the Falls. I went, his girlfriend, Miranda? Oh yeah, no, she's not in the book. The red-headed guy? No, he's not in the book either. And that's when I realized that they were not actually filming the books. They were filming stories they were making up themselves to fit the one hour that they were allowed on TV. So that was when I decided, no, you can't make any more, I'm gonna get the rights back, and now we are presenting a new script to the BBC and various <laughs> other companies in the hope that they'll do it long form. So it won't be one hour per book anymore, it will be eight hours per book. If they're willing to put the money up for it, because that's an expensive thing to do, eight hours of drama. And it's, um, we're in a, we're in a um, playwriting area here, so I'll say that it's Gregory Burke who has done the script, who wrote Black Watch, uh, and, and his, it will be Garen Way, and he's a great playwright. So he started life as a playwright, and now he's written a two hour pilot episode for the reboot of Reboot. Told you, long answers. <laughs> They've got a thousand questions here. <laughs> well, maybe we get through five. <laughs> um, Ian, um, you are first and foremost an author, but what many people maybe don't know is that in 2013 you actually wrote your very first play, uh, Dark Road, which was produced uh, here in the Lyceum and mm -hmm. actually rehearsed in this very room, I believe. Uh, given the fact that you were an author for years before this, was it easy for you to think about going into playwright, um, uh, uh, playwriting, or was it quite, a, you know, you know, you know, you know, was it quite a daunting prospect? It's it's a very different way of telling a story. Um, now, when I was young, when I was at university, and I still didn't know what kind of writer I wanted to be, I had written a, a couple of plays that never got anywhere. I wrote plays for radio that never got made into radio plays. I wrote plays for the stage. One of them was read out at the Traverse Theatre, I think it was, um, uh, as part of a playwriting workshop. Um, I was just trying to find what was, what kind, how can I tell best tell the kinds of stories I want to tell? So, it, I wasn't successful, it didn't work. And then you flash forward and the Lyceum Theatre get in touch and say, have you ever thought about doing a stage play. Um, and I'd done a couple of radio plays by that time. I'd actually written a couple that were made into BBC radio plays. And that was good fun. Working with actors is fun. So um, we did a stage play uh, here. And it was really hard. <laughs> I thought, I'm never doing that again. Um, it was, uh, I mean, I was lucky because the, 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 the um, the director you know, was also a playwright and, and he helped me a lot with it. Um, Mr. Thompson used to run this place, with a rod of iron, Mark Thompson. And so he would say, Ian, no, you can't have 65 characters. <laughs> you can in a book, but not in a play, buddy. You can't have 37 scene changes, 26 costume changes, you know, time passing like the way it does in books. Um, we can't make it happen. And he worked his socks off, him and a designer worked his socks off to try and make it as true to my vision as they could within the confines of an actual stage. And so we sat here for weeks working out how to do it with a revolving stage and a thing that came up, came and sort of went in front of the stage. 
what was revolving with light effects, sound effects. Oh my God, every night something went wrong. <laughs> the audience didn't always know. You know, there was one, one great night when the police chief, because it, it was a crime thing, and it was uh, Maureen Beatty. Maureen Beatty played the main character, the police chief. And she's supposed to be frustrated when she smashes a cup. Well, they hadn't put the cup out on her desk. So she's, she's, she's doing the scene, she's looking, there's no cup. She's looking, there's no cup. She knows she has to smash something because somebody's going to come in and say she'll like clean up. So she just picked up the telephone and chucked it to the ground. And then the actor who hadn't seen her do that walked in and said, shall I make you another cup? <laughs> something so but it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun and people uh, sitting in an audience watching a play the lovely thing was that thing you don't get from writing a novel when I write a novel and you read it I'm a long way away I'm not sitting next to you while you're reading it when you're just sitting at the first night of a play at the back watching the audience laugh jump because they got a fright going out at half time talking about it what's going on is it him? Did she do it? Did he do it? What's, you know, it was such a buzz. It really, and I could see that adrenaline that actors get from a stage performance and also that people working in the theatre and an audience get. It's a very visceral, immediate response. And that I loved, which is why we did a second one with Rebus, which did not play at the Lyceum, it played at the King's Theatre. And notably, things can go wrong. Our actor had a stroke on the stage oh. on the opening night in Edinburgh. And it was a mini stroke, but two thirds of the way through the play, he suddenly collapsed. And the um, stand in had to come on and finish the play. He's fine, he's all right. But um, he, he missed about three days. He was so embarrassed about missing three days. But yeah, so there's that that you don't get in a novel. You don't get that sense that every night you're walking a tightrope. You know, the audience, the actors, the light designers, everybody is walking a tightrope, which is quite thrilling. <laughs> um, and just quickly, just to add to quickly um, <laughs> <laughs> to that um, to that last question. Um, obviously, as you said, Long Shadow is is a play, but it's also part of the Rebus series. Mm. Were you quite um, given the fact that Rebus uh, quite often appears uh, in books? And that was obviously his first stage appearance. Were you quite um, nervous about how the public would respond to see him do this on stage? Yeah, totally, um, totally. Uh, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't sure how, how it would work because we decided um, the playwright was Rona Munro, another great Scottish playwright. She did the James plays and she's done a ton of stuff. She's also written for Doctor Who, um, and sh and she was really good to work with. We wrote it together and, and she was incredibly uh, proactive in that. Um, but when it was cast, uh, they cast a guy called Charles Lawson as Rebus. And I went, I, I don't know him, who is he? Well, he plays Big Jim McDonald in Coronation Street. I went, hang on, is he no Irish? And I went, yeah, he's Irish. But honestly, you can do a good Scottish accent. <laughs> okay, if you say so. So I went to the opening night in Birmingham, and there was big Jim McDonald from Coronation Street on stage, and yes, he could do a Scottish accent. He's an actor, of course he could do a Scottish accent. And he said to me backstage, he said, Ian, you know, I drank in the Oxford bar before you did. <coughs> and it was true, he had a friend who was an architect, and he used to drink in the Oxford bar in the 1970s, 10 years before I ever went. Um, but yeah, it was in, we decided we would do, it was Rebus, but it was not part of what we call the canon. So we could, we could take some liberties. So for example, in the play, Cafferty the gangster, who's in the Rebus books, has a daughter who's never going to appear in the books. It worked on stage as part of the play, but it was never going to be, in my mind, it was never going to be part of the books. Rebus in the books has a dog. We thought, nope, <laughs> no, no animals on stage. Thank you very much. Um, Rebus's daughter, I don't think, got a mention because we thought, no, that's it, of a whole thing we need to explain. So there were changes, but um, it went down well. People really loved it. So they've asked me to do a second Rebus play, um, which is underway at the moment. And again, it will be Rebus, but it'll be a slightly different world from the world of the books. If 
if it works. Um, given the fact that obviously Long Shadows was your second play and you've written Dragonborn before that, was it easy to think about writing um, Long Shadows uh, compared to Dark Road, or, or was there more pressure to make the play um, just as successful as Dark Road was? It was a very different thing because the um, Dark Road, I wrote with Mark Thompson, artistic director of the Lyceum, was the Lyceum project, and was never shown outside the Lyceum such a complicated staging that it was only ever going to be, it was a revolving stage and stuff. No, people came and looked at it, but they thought, shit, we can't afford to put that on in our wee regional theatre here and there. So it was only ever shown in Edinburgh. Whereas when I was approached to do the Rebus play, the producer knew he wanted to tour. He knew the tour in mind. So it was going to play everywhere in the UK, all across the UK. Um, so that was different. And if you're going to do that, a touring play, what you want is, is actors who've been in Game of Thrones. That's what you want. You want that to be in Game of Thrones. So, um, so the the villain who played Caffrey, the villain John Stahl, the actor, was from Game of Thrones. And eventually, we also got when um, Big Jim McDonald had to drop out because he was going back to Coronation Street, and uh, we then got Ron Donaghy to play Rebus, and he was also in Game of Thrones. Um, and you had, you know, originally we had. Charlie Lawson, who was in Coronation Street. That's what you want when you're doing regional theatre and you want to fill the seats. You've got people from TV that people know. Um, that's how you do it. And um, it has to have an interval because the theatre makes its money from the drinks. The theatre doesn't make its money from the playroom. It makes its money from the drinks at half time. These are the kind of economic necessities of trying to have a, a, a working theatre. Um, unless you're doing a panto, um, which will fill every seat night after night. Um, so, it was in, so all of that was taken into account. Now that didn't interfere with my writing process. You know, I was not aware of that. But when I'd written the play and I went to see the play, I went, okay, all of this stuff has to happen to make a play workable. So, you know, the next Rebus play um, will only be put on if enough theatres say, yeah, we want it. We think we can fill three nights, five nights, six nights with this. And our th I mean, the theatre at the Lyceum, honestly, if you, next time you're at the Lyceum, go and ask the bar manager. The best night's takings they ever had was Dark Road. Um, they've never seen anything like it. Rebus Re Rankin fans, Rebus fans, like a drink. <laughs> and I, and I, I, do, I don't know where they get that from. <laughs> I suppose it's a difficult thing to write a book, write a story that you have envisioned and then for that to either make it onto the stage or onto TV. Do you feel, do you feel that your vision for what you had for Rebus, has it lived up to the TV and the theatre? I mean, I, I think I'm very good at putting these things into different compartments. The TV rebus is not my rebus. The theatre rebus is not my rebus. The guy in the books is my rebus. You know, it's just a pure transaction between me and a piece of paper, or me and a computer screen. And that's my world. As soon as other people become involved, it's not mine anymore. So when you look for TV, when you look for theatre, you've got directors, producers, money people, lighting, theater, set design, costumes, vocal coaches, special effects, you name it. I don't have any of that as a writer. The reason I, I like writing novels is because novelists get to play God. I get complete control. And as soon as it's another art form like theater or TV or radio, I have got to lose some of that control. And I'm a control freak. So I don't like doing it. I don't like doing it. I don't like working with people. Uh, you know, I sat in this room for weeks, weeks watching the actors do rehearsals for Dark Road because Mark Thompson liked his writer to be in the room with him. And I'm going to hire Because they always had really difficult questions. <laughs> They'll say things like, Ian, what's the structure of the police force in Scotland? 
so I can get where I am in the hierarchy. I go, I don't know. <laughs> There's a chief constable, and there's some folk around here, quite high up, and there's folk down there, and there's folk in the middle. I don't know. How far up the car? How, how, why do you need to know that? Yeah. And I go, and, and why does he do that here? What? Why, why does he go there? I don't know. He just, he just does. That's what he's, that's what he's like. Yeah. And I don't know. These are questions that I never need to ask myself when I'm writing the books. I don't, I, you know, there's nobody sitting with me when I'm writing the books going, you sure about that? <laughs> or why is he doing that? I said, well, that's what he's doing. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. So it's such a different process. Um, and things, I mean, I, I love working with actors. When I did the radio plays years and years ago, I did these two radio plays, which were meant to be films. To film them was going to cost eight to 10 million pounds. And to turn them into radio plays was going to cost about 8,000 pounds. We turned them into radio <laughs> And sitting in a, in a room with actors with a script going through it, the actor would say things like, isn't it funnier if he says this? And I would say, yes, it is. It's much funnier. And I got the credit for it. <laughs> when it was on the radio, they didn't, they didn't say, oh, by the way, this joke's, this was the actor's joke here. You, just, you get the credit because you're the writer. Well, they loved that. <laughs> and, um, and I mean, I do, you know, it's, it's terrible to say this in a favor, and I can theatre context, Long Haul is a theatre company, but radio theatre, is radio drama, uh, is, is my favourite medium because it, it just is so quick and easy to do. I mean, it's so quick and easy to do. But a guy sitting at a desk, and I said, he said, it's 18th century Edinburgh, buddy. I went, aye, 18th century Edinburgh. What sort of year? Well, about 1790. 1790, okay. Would there be animals walking about and stuff? Aye, there'd be, there'd be maybe chickens and dogs and that. Okay, we'll put some dogs in. Do you want a big dog or a small dog? Uh -huh. <laughs> you go, big dog, you go like that. <laughs> 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 okay, we'll put one of them in the background. It's a street scene, street scene. Do you want a clock chime in? Like, top of, aye, a clock chime. Do you want that kind of clock or that kind of clock? The church tower clock. Uh, we'll love that kind of clock. Good stuff, here we go. All right, <laughs> put some up in it. Just, well, and he's in it on this computer going, blah, 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 blah. Right, let's hit it, hit it. And suddenly you're listening to 18th century, uh, 19th century, 18th century Edinburgh, 1790s Edinburgh. You're like, yeah, that's probably what it sounded like, to be walking down the high street. And he would just do it. And I just thought, this is phenomenal. And then for the really old-fashioned effects, it just even that was incredible. So they had the sedan chairman. The streets of Edinburgh were so steep, you couldn't get a horse and cart up them, or a proper kind of horse and carriage. So you had sedan chairmen who were big brawny Highlanders, two of them with a wee thing in the middle and you were sitting in the thing in the middle. Okay, we need a scene like that. Great. A bed of gravel in the studio, a bed of gravel, the two chairmen, each holding up a ladder. So the two metal ladders were holding as they were crunching on the gravel. And then the passenger standing in between them with a cardboard box in his head. <laughs> And you're watching it through the screen going, this is fucking ridiculous. <laughs> and then you listen to the radio and you go, oh my God. I'm in 18th century Edinburgh in a sedan chair. Oh, it's terrible weather today, isn't it? Yes, sir, it's terrible weather today. <laughs> crunch, crunch, crunch. Oh, but we'll get there soon. Yes, we'll be there soon, sir. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Oh my God. That suspension of disbelief is so much easier on radio than it is even in a theatre. It can be. I mean, Re Remus is on radio. They do one a year, and it's Ron Donaghy, who I mentioned before, um, plays Remus on Radio 4 these days, and that's done for a few years now. And I do like the radio, the way they do it on radio. Um, I'm going to forget the name of the guy who uh, does the radio, who writes the radio versions, but he's very true to the, the, the story. He's very true to the feel of the, the, the books. And Bruce Young is the producer. Um, or Chris Dolan. Chris Dolan is the writer who does them, who's also a novelist, crime novelist, and, and literary novelist. And uh, Bruce Young directs it, produces it. And Ron Donaghy is, is just great. He was in the first play that did here. Ron Donaghy was in this very room doing Dark Road. Um, uh, he was the old cop in Dark Road. And when he came on, to, when he came to do um, the Rebus play, I went to see it in Newcastle. 
and I'm just so happy. The cast didn't know I was there because um, Charles Lawson, who played Rebus, had gone back to Coronation Street. It had been a success, so they kept it going, so they brought in um, Ron Donaghy. And the only chance I was going to get to see it was to take a train down to Newcastle. So I turned up at Newcastle, just went and bought a ticket, walked in, sat there and watched Ron Donaghy be Rebus. And I just thought he did it really, really well. So he's been with me the whole way through, whether it's Rebus on radio, or Rebus on stage, or my other stage play. The only thing he's not done so far is Rebus on TV. <laughs> Let's wait and see. <laughs> on the subject of Rebus, actually, um, in the 2017 novel, uh, Rather Be the Devil, Rebus has COPD. Mm. Given the fact that COPD is actually a real life illness, is that more pressure um, on you as a writer to get it right? Um, yeah, I mean, I made the decision early on that Rebus would live more or less in real time. So we're now dealing with a guy in his mid to late 60s who has smoked and drank his whole life and eaten fish suppers and not taken any exercise. And my wife said, look, He's had a very lucky, charmed existence, but that has to come to an end. So her friend, who's a, a doctor, said to me, well, he might well have COPD. I went, oh good, it's got the word cop in it. <laughs> COPD actually has the word cop in it. I quite like that. So I gave him COPD emphysema, as we used to call it. And yeah, that changes the goalposts. He knows he's not immortal. He knows mortality is tapping him on the shoulder. Um, he can't climb stairs anymore. Um, in fact, spot well, you are filming. I shouldn't tell you this. The next book is going to open with him moving from his flat. Because he's, he, I put him in a flat in Arden Street where I was a student, and it's two flights up, a tenement, two floors up. He can't do that anymore. With emphysema, with COPD, he can't do that. So the first thing that happens in the new book is he moves. Because um, I, I met I mean, a guy I know who has emphysema, who has COPD. I phone him up every book and say, look, what would Rebus be doing now? He's done it for a year, he's done it for two years, he's done it for three years. How's he coping? And he's the one who says, look, you know, stairs are going to be a real issue, etc., etc." So that's how the next book's going to open, because I want him to feel real. He feels real to me. I thought, if he, if he doesn't age, how can he feel real? We know the world is moving on very quickly, we know Edinburgh keeps changing. How can I talk about these changes if he doesn't age? So. He's having to deal with that. And I'm quite enjoying that challenge. I'm enjoying the challenge, but I know that it does limit what he can do. Now, also, the next book is going to be partly set up the very far north of Scotland. And Rebus has been driving the same car since 1987. <laughs> uh, a Saab 900. I think that's got to go. I don't think a, a 1987 Saab 900 is going to make it as far as the north of Scotland. <coughs> So I think uh, he's in trouble. He's in trouble for all kinds of reasons. Also, he can't take his dog with him. He can't take the dog to North of Scotland, but I can't kill the dog. So, so I've got that you, can't, you cannot kill pets in fiction, no. I, I did it once before, a long time ago. I killed a cat in the Rebus books. Oh my God, the grief I got. So I should never have given him a, I should never have given him a Anyway, I like these challenges. I do like these challenges, and I think it makes him, it makes me interested in him. So when I'm writing a book, it's not like I'm going through the motions. His life has moved on, my life has moved on, um, and it makes it interesting for me to keep writing about this guy. But there is an end point. We're definitely reaching an end point. There's only so much I can do with him, and there's only so much he can do. So, time for one or two more. Keep it quick. I suppose, well... Go for the interesting. <laughs> They're all interesting. Well, actually, this one's going to be quite, quite off the cards. Good. And I suppose that is, is that, um, is that in books, it's quite important to have, to have actual experiences that people themselves can relate to as well. And in your books, that has been quite apparent that there's events that perhaps you yourself have been through or that other people are going through and they can relate to that mm. and 
do you feel that is a very important thing to have? It's, well, I, I don't know how important it is as a novelist to be writing about personal experience. I don't think you need to do that. If you want to write about spaceships in the year 2525, do it. Um, if you want to write about the plague in medieval times, do it. You don't have to be through the plague to write about that stuff. But the books have always been, for me, a form of therapy. And so I've taken on board things that have happened to me in my life. My son being born disabled. Uh, I channeled into the Rebus books by having his daughter be put in a wheelchair for a while. She was in a hit and run accident because I was dealing with my son being in a wheelchair. Um, uh, Rebus getting older and getting a bit decrepit. I'm going, yeah, that's me. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, it really is. Um, what is weird is that I, my trajectory in life physically seems to be that of not Rebus, but his nemesis, Cafferty. So for years, Cafferty lived in Merkison, in a nice big Victorian house, which was where I lived. A couple of books ago, I moved, Merkis I moved um, Cafferty to Quarter Mile, to a penthouse flat. Guess where I live now? <laughs> I live in a penthouse flat in Quarter Mile. And the lift has stopped working. <laughs> so I know how Cafferty would deal with that. I'm not dealing with the way he would do it. <laughs> he would basically go down to the concierge with a gun and say, if that lift isn't operating tomorrow, I'm coming back. Um, I can't do that. I just have to write a wee letter. <laughs> Dear sir, I am very disappointed. <laughs> I've been climbing up three flights of stairs for the past two years. Um, so all of that, it's just a way of dealing with stuff. I think it, writing has always been like that for me. You know, writing when I was a kid, to go back to the beginning of our conversation, was an escape from carbon death. It was an escape from what I thought was a fairly mundane existence, um, a fairly ordinary existence. And it has continued to be so. And all the adventures I have in my life, I have in my books. So my real life is actually quite boring. I'm mostly sitting in front of the computer all day, eating Snickers bars. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, Rebus has been a really interesting way for me to deal with a lot of dark stuff personal dark stuff, but also just thinking, what the fuck is going on in the world? What? We're in chaos. It's chaos. You look around and you go, you can't make this shit up. You know what I mean? You can't. You look at Trump, you go, I, can't, I couldn't invent that guy. I'm a novelist. I couldn't make that believable. <laughs> Brexit? Johnson? I really, I write fiction and I just cannot imagine trying to make that credible or believable. And people are coming to fiction going, mm -hmm. Please give me a world that I can believe in, because I can no longer believe in reality. So it's a kind of weird time to be a writer. It really is a weird time to be a writer. And I use writing, and always have done, to try and answer questions that I've got about the world around me. About the way the world is, the way politics are, the way that human beings react. Why do we human beings do terrible things over and over again? That's what all crime fiction is about. And I've been trying to answer that question now for uh, well over 30 years. And I'm not getting any closer <laughs> to an answer. But I always enjoy asking the question. Yes, right, one more, one more, one more. Has your approach to writing changed at all over the years? My approach, well, the way I write, has the way I write changed over the years? Um, oh, um, not well, has it? I don't know. I mean, it used to be that it was a hobby. And so I didn't have much time to do it. Then it became a full-time job, so I had a lot of time to do it. But what I find is that I write best when I'm under pressure. So, as I talk to you, I've had a year off. This year has not been a writing year. So you think, well, he's had a whole year to think about his next book. No, I've not done that. <laughs> the next book has to be done by June next year, and I've not even started writing it yet. And, the, and I'm, I'm starting to feel the panic. I am starting to feel that terrible fear that I need to get this thing done. And when the fear comes, the adrenaline starts. When the adrenaline starts, the brain starts turning. And there'll come a day when I just sit down and actually start it. Um, and that's how I've always done it. I write the first draft very quickly. I always have done 40 days max. 40 days maximum for the first draft. Um, and then just polish it and polish it. And I give it to my wife. The second draft goes to my wife. Maybe the second or third draft goes to my wife. And that's the most nerve-wracking. Because nobody's seen it. My agent's not seen it. Publisher's not seen it. Nobody's seen anything of it. No ideas, no plots, no snippets. I give it to Miranda. 
and she sits down with a pen <laughs> and starts writing the margins of the manuscript. And I go, oh, no. She's taking a long time. And oh, no, she's like, oh, she's turned the page over. She's writing on the back of the page. Um, and, I, you know, and she's a great reader. So it's only when, it, so the most nerve-wracking part of the process is going through her notes. And the book doesn't go to my agent or my publisher until I've read her notes and I've gone back and polished the book one final time based on what she said, because I trust her as a reader. Most of these days, what she says is, shouldn't Rebus have taken the dog for a walk? <laughs> when did he last feed the dog? <laughs> if he's going to this part of Edinburgh to ask some questions, couldn't he take the dog with him? <laughs> That's most of what it is. And then, now and again, information dump. Find a way to say this better. So, if, when she's happy, I'm happy, then it goes to the public. We should open up to questions. Yes. We yes, should. Yes. We've got about 10 or 15 minutes left. We're going to put house lights up for this. Mm -hmm. Yay, look at that. Yeah, what a magic yeah, technology. Yeah. And another glass of wine. Going <laughs> there's, there's one non professional sitting in the front there. And we all say, no, I'm soft drinks only because I'm working. Yeah. We've um, got two roving mics, so if you have a question, you just wait till you have it. <coughs> so. And wave your hand. Oh, well, we have one here. Front row. Uh, when you started your new book, the new storyline, uh, what comes first, the development of the storyline or the uh, or the characters' development? What comes first, the, the story or the characters? Well, you know, I've got my characters. I'm very happy with Rebus and Siobhan Clark and Martin Fox and Caffrey. So I, that's one of the problems. I don't have to think too much about them so I can get lazy. So I do have to think about them. But to make sure that I don't get lazy and just go through the motions. Normally, what happens is I'm, I, I'm a, I'm a um, I was going to say notorious, that's not the word I'm looking for. Um, I read a lot of news, newspapers, radio news, TV news, um, and I'll be cutting stories out of the paper and the magazines, you know, anything that I think's interesting. And I go through all of that, I've got a big folder I go through, and I find things that I think, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that, and that's interesting, that could connect to that in this way. So I've got a kind of vague theme that I want to explore. And I find a crime that will allow me to explore that theme. It's usually a question. Usually a question. Um, and then, which characters do I need? Who do I need to pull into the story? But there's not a lot of pre-planning goes on. There's not a lot of um, note-taking or synopsis. I've never really got a synopsis when I start the book. I just start and see where the book wants to go. Now, it's not a science, so that might not work for anybody else. I've, I've interviewed a lot of writers. Everybody's different. But what works for me is not knowing the ending when I start. And if I think I know the ending, usually by the time I've written the first draft, that isn't the ending. The book is a much more interesting idea of where it wants to go. So I just trust to the book. I trust to this notion that there is a, a theme and a plot that are already up there somewhere in the ether that are going to come down to me and show me where they want to go. And some people would find that absolutely terrifying. And it is absolutely terrifying <laughs> at times. But I just know it's going to work. It's, always, it's worked for over 30 years. So when I'm halfway through a book, three quarters of the way through a book, first draft, and I still don't know who the killer is. I go, well, I'll know by the end. <laughs> you know, the book will tell me who the killer is by the time we get to the end, and it always works. <laughs> that would be touching wood, by the way. Got another line for Skier? We passed the mic in the second row. Keep your hand up. There you go. Hi. I'm sure you you have at times been fed up with Rebus. Will you ever, or have you ever already, done a J.K. Rowling and write a book anonymously, a different genre? Um, yeah, I mean, I've got, I, I did get rid of Rebus. I thought, um, <coughs> because, as I said earlier on, the books are set in real time. Uh, I've, quite a few years ago now, I got a phone call from a cop in Edinburgh, and he said, how old is Rebus? 
I said he's 58, 59. Why? He said he has to retire at 60. <laughs> what? <laughs> I thought the retirement age for men was 65. No. In the Scottish Police Force, 55 for uniform, 60 for CID. So I said to my publisher, I'm really sorry about this, but there's only one more rate this book. And I wrote it, Exit Music. Exit Music, he retires, he's 60. That was meant to be the last book. And I thought, that's it, I'm done. And I wrote, other, I wrote Doors Open, which was a heist set in Edinburgh. I invented a new character called Malcolm Fox, an in, internal affairs cop. Um, I wrote a libretto for an opera. I wrote this, that. And, you know, I was having some fun writing different things. But Rebus wouldn't die. And I got an idea for a story which involved um, a cold case review. And there was, there was a unit in Edinburgh at Fetis Police Headquarters that dealt with cold cases, and it was staffed by retired detectives. And I thought, well, that's what he would be doing. He would not have opened up a bed and breakfast in Portobello. <laughs> he would not be driving a car or an Uber. He would not have opened a pub. I thought of all the things ex-cops do, and thought Remus wouldn't be doing anything. He's a cop. That's what he is to his very toes. So if he got the option to go and work as a civilian for the cold case unit, that's what he would do. So brought him back. And it was like he just refused to die. Really interesting. Um, and then an MSP um, for Fife stood up in the, in the chamber of the Scottish Parliament and said, can we change the retirement age for detectives in Scotland so that Rebus can come back? <laughs> her name was Helen Eady. God bless her, she's no longer with us. Um, and they did talk about changing the retirement age <laughs> upwards because they couldn't afford to pay the pensions for these cops who were retiring at 40 and 45. Once you got 30 years in, you could retire. Um, it wasn't even 30. It was about 30. 48. We were retiring at 48. Um, so I brought him back as a cop for a few years. And then I thought, no, he's got to retire. So now he is long, he's now retired. But I quite like that. I quite like the fact that he said there is this traject trajectory to his life. And even now that he's in his mid to late 60s, he still wants to feel useful. That's what these later books are. These later books are about two guys, really, Ravis and Cafferty, in their mid to late 60s, looking around them at the world. It doesn't make sense to them anymore. Nothing about the world makes sense to these guys. And they wonder if they can still make a difference. Do they still have a role to play? That's what the later books are about. So it's a very different feel. I've gone back and read the early books. The early books are much more, um, what's the word? Physical. Rebus is a much more physical cop, and uh, they're, they're, they're visceral, much more visceral books. These later books are more um, elegiac, I think. But I still think they're good books. I would say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got time for about two more. So we've got one right up the back there. Yeah. Right, um, Hi. As well as being an author and a playwright, you're also a singer in a band, I believe. Um, could you tell us a bit more about that project and if you have any plans to play live? Uh, I am a singer in the band, thank you, young man. Yeah. <laughs> um, the first thing I ever wanted to be when I was a writer was a singer. Yeah. I was, I was in, you know, it's the thing when you're a kid in the 60s and 70s, I was into pop music. Pop music was an escape. You looked at David Bowie on TV, wow, like an alien had landed in Carbondale. <laughs> So I invented a band called the Amoebas, and I was a lead singer, and I wrote the lyrics, I designed their album sleeves, I took them on tour, but only in my head and on paper. And then when I was 17 or 18, I joined a punk band in Fife called the Amoebas, no, called the Dancing Pigs. Dancing Pigs, the second best punk band in Fife. <laughs> Two punk bands in five years. The Skids and us. That lasted a year. And then a few years ago, I was asked if I wanted to be in a band in my late 50s. And I went, yeah. Why the hell not? And it was a bunch of guys in their 50s who should know better. And we're called Best Picture. And we get together not very often. 
<laughs> and we rehearse, and we write songs, and we had one single released, a pink bag. <coughs> I'll explain later on what final is. <laughs> <laughs> and we've done a few gigs. We're doing, a, we're doing gigs next month. We're, we support Hipsway oh. in the Liquid Rooms in Edinburgh and at St. Luke's in Glasgow. I said to the guitarist, Bobby from the Bluebells, Bobby Bluebell, yeah, yeah he's a rhythm guitarist. Uh, I said, did they know we only play 15 minutes? <laughs> we've only got three or four songs. <laughs> anyway, it's fun. It's fun, that collaborative thing. Uh, it's different. It's a different way of looking at storytelling. The the, the lyrics, because I write the lyrics for all these songs. It's a way of telling a story a different way, and uh, I quite like it. I quite like it. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> I don't think we're going to appear on Jules Holland anytime soon. <laughs> I'll explain later on for young people. Who just... <laughs> <laughs> right. Got one more. Right. Oh, yeah. Jim. Front row middle. Come on, front row middle. Here. He said he's hand up a lot. <laughs> It's going to be a terrible question as well. It's going to be a really, it's going to be a real crushing question. No pressure. <laughs> uh, it's interesting that you see, you know, Rebus is roughly about your kind of age, round about the 60. I noticed from your date. He's much older than me. Well, <laughs> well, well the year of birth, 1960. Right. So he was, he was born around in the late 50s. 48, 49. In real, in real, in, in dog years. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that would be 69, 70, yeah. Say, oh, yeah. in, re in, in the real world, it would be 70, right, right. but I've chopped off the five years I didn't write about. Okay. <laughs> so when I finished exit music, the five years I didn't write about, I've chopped off, so it's 66, 67. Right, a bit of license then. Yeah. Anyway, do you see any similarities in this, this man, Rebus, in Ian Rankin? Um, and now that Ian Rankin's getting to that age, what, what do writers who get you know into the the golden years let's call them you know, what, 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 what do you see for, for yourself do you see yourself being like Rebus to write in a different way or? oh my god um I, that's, a, that's a good question but a difficult question to answer i mean rebus he's not me <clears throat> he was never me really i mean he comes from he was born in the same town as me he left school at 15 and joined the army I was at school till 18 and went to university. Our lives split at that point. And um, although we might have a similar way of looking at the world, he's got a much more cynical view of the world than I do. He, because of his job, um, he's only seen the bad people and terrible situations. He's not seen what a beautiful city he lives in. Um, he's not seen you know, there's a lot of stuff he's not seen that I've seen. I'm much more liberal than him. Um, he seen, he's, he's, he's a, he's a polarising figure. He sees the world in terms of good and evil. You know, there's no great area for him. There's only these extremes of good and evil. And my, com my job sometimes is to convince him there are grades, gradations here. So what I tend to do is have a conversation with him in the books. And I use people like Malcolm Fox and Siobhan Clark to have that conversation on my behalf. I'm much more like them than I'm like them. But yeah, we're both getting older. And he aches in the places where he used to play, as uh, Leonard Cohen once said. And I'm going through exactly that. The ears don't work, the eyes don't work, the knees are short, you know. I mean, he's gone through all that five or 10 years ahead of me. And yeah, if you trace it back in book one, 1987, book one, he's already 40. So he ergo born in 47. Um, which is problematic for me. So I slowed him, I slowed down his rate of decrepitude <laughs> somewhat, a wee bit, a wee bit. But he's still mid to late 60s. So he can't chase suspects anymore. He can't get in fights anymore. He can't use his heft. He's not got physical intimidation the way he used to really intimidate people. He can't do that anymore. So he used to have different skills. And again, that's part of the fun for me is, is him realizing that he has to change his, his modus operandi. Um, and I really, I, I, you know, I'm enjoying spending time with his later readers. He's not the macho figure. He's not a Jack Reacher, you know? Back in book one, he could have taken on Jack Reacher. Now, he'd sit down and have a drink with him. And, you know, either gracefully or disgracefully, whatever you want to say. Oh, well, it's, you know what? I mean, well, the COPD is a problem because COPD is that to stop smoking. He can't smoke anymore. He's had to cut back on the drinking. 
his um, his girlfriend, if you can say that she's a girlfriend of the ages they are, has got him trying mindfulness. That's not working terribly well, I've got to say, but she's got him trying to listen to Arvo Park music and Brian Eno. He's not into it. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, all the things that, you know, that maybe in a, in a way the things, I mean, he, he said it, I mean, maybe the things I'm going through, I just project on him and always have done. And um, he's a few years ahead of me, a few years ahead of me. And I mean, if my lift doesn't get fixed anytime soon, I will be moving that. I will be moving that ground floor flat next door. Yeah, um, there'll be two of them cheek by jowl in our ground floor flats because neither of us can manage two flights of stairs anymore. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up. Listen, I do want. To, I mean, we're going to get thanks in a minute, but I do want to thank you for coming and being such a lovely, patient audience and a cold night as well. So thanks very much for coming. Yes. Yeah. We do have a couple more thank yous. So we got thanks to uh, Book Week Scotland for taking part in this and letting us do this in their programme. To John Robb and the Edinburgh International Festival for all of their tech support. The Lyceum for hosting the event. Light Audio for their tech support as well. Claire, Claire, Karina and Kate for filming the event. And Paul for doing the photography. And for Blackwell's selling the books. And Orion Books for making the event possible. And above all, you like it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>